11th of March, 1815, and the bugles are blowing assembly. The 600 men of Napoleon Bonaparte's personal bodyguard, the troops who escaped with the little Corsican from the island of Elba just six days ago, are falling into line. Once again, Napoleon is on the march. He may go forward up the winding mountain road to Lapry Pass and attack the 1,000 royalist soldiers entrenched there blocking his way to Paris. An almost suicidal operation. Or the former French emperor may decide to retreat southward towards the city of Gap, arm the French peasants, an act which will most certainly plunge all France into a bloody civil war. The order to assemble came just a few moments ago, just as the first gray streaks of dawn began to appear in the sky above this little French alpine village. In characteristic... March 7, 1815, Young France, you are there. Napoleon Bonaparte, six days returned from exile on the island of Elba, moves to counter the roadblock King Louis XVIII has thrown up between him and Paris. CBS takes you back 134 years to the obscure but dramatic episode which determined the fate of the little Corsican spectacular attempt to recapture the throne of France. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. When CBS is there, you are there. You Are There, produced and directed by Robert Louis Cheon, is based on authentic historical fact and quotation. And now, the village of La Mille in the French Alps and John Daly. We know what Napoleon will do. March up that road from La Mure to Lefrey Pass and undertake a desperate attack on the king's troops entrenched up there. Or turn back to Gap, arm the French peasants for civil war in France. Napoleon has given no indication of what he intends to do. Last night, when he arrived at La Mure, and the scouts reported the fallen troops at Lafrey Pass, Napoleon immediately went into conference with his staff officers. They took over the house of the mayor of La Mure. We're broadcasting from the porch of that house now, and there's been no sign of Napoleon or any of his officers all night. Outside, here in the village square... Several hundred people are gathered, even at this early hour. They've come from all parts of the surrounding countryside, waiting for a glimpse of Napoleon, and an officer has just come out the door. Compliments of Marshal Bertrand, sir. He will speak with you now if you will come inside. Thank you very much. Marshal Bertrand is Napoleon's chief of staff. He was with the former French emperor on Elba all during the year of his exile. We're inside the house now, in the parlor, a typical room of a typical middle-class French provincial family, a room stuffed with overstuffed furniture. Several of Napoleon's staff officers are standing about, talking quietly, and Marshal Bertrand is approaching us now. I've been instructed by His Majesty to inform you that he shall be pleased to speak with you in a few moments. Thank you very much, Marshal Bertrand. Can you tell us what Napoleon has decided to do? Uh, May I sit down, please? I'm very weary, very tired. Please do. Yeah. Uh, What uh, was it you asked me again? Uh, What decision has His Majesty made? Which way will he go? Ahead to Lafrey Pass or back to Grenoble? I don't know. I just don't know. I presume His Majesty will tell him that. Well, uh, what do you think his decision will be, sir? I don't know. Well, you've been talking with the Emperor all night, Marshal. Yes, yes, all night, all night. Well, may we ask uh, what you have suggested, sir? There is no harm, I suppose, in telling you. From a military point of view, I consider our position highly insecure. I believe, and I spent many, many hours last night attempting to convince His Majesty, I believe that we have no choice but to retrace our steps to Gap, consolidate our position, arm the peasants, then, with the citizens' army, march on Paris. But won't that mean civil war, Marshal? Frenchmen fighting Frenchmen. Frenchmen? Any man who fights under the standard of the bull boy is not Frenchman. Oh. For 25 
five years, Louis and his followers have lived away from France. They have fought in the armies of the enemies of France. They have intrigued, plotted to overthrow the legitimate government of France and destroy the reforms, the good that has come to our people since the revolution. No. Fighting the Bourbons would not be fighting Frenchmen. It would be fighting the enemies of France. Well, what has Napoleon said to your argument, sir? Uh, not a word. As usual, His Majesty listens. Then makes up his own mind. Napoleon is coming down the stairs. He wears his very familiar long gray overcoat, military boots, cocked hat, and under the brim of the hat, that famous lock of hair that seems plastered to his forehead. The former emperor of the French seems to have taken another sleepless night a lot better than most of the younger officers of his staff. He's smiling, seems to be at ease, confident. He stopped for a moment to talk with Marshal Detrain and the other officers of his staff. Napoleon has just said something to his officers, something I haven't been able to hear, something that's brought looks of astonishment to their faces. They're all speaking at once now. I don't know what they're saying, but Napoleon shakes his head. He seems to be the only one unperturbed, but the men about him are showing every evidence of being highly exasperated, highly disturbed. Napoleon just stands in their midst, calm and confident. This is the man whose enemies thought they had buried him on Elba as good as dead, better than dead, for to them a dead Napoleon was something that might rise up to haunt them, but a Napoleon rotting away on Elba was nothing to be afraid of, just a fat old man put out to pasture. Now here he stands again in the flesh, the man who rose from obscurity to mastery of all Europe, a strange magnetic personality capable of inspiring men and women to intense loyalty and equally intense hatred. A man whose every act has been the subject of bitter controversy and influence for great good or great evil, depending pretty much on what point of view you take toward him. Here he is, as dynamic, as forceful as ever. His Majesty has stopped talking with his officers. He's coming this way now. Monsieur, you are no doubt wondering why I have a to speak with you at this time. The people of America are intensely interested in anything you have to say, sire. Yes, I am well aware of that. Between your people and mine, there is a solid bond of brotherhood. For both our people are children of revolution. That is why I wish to speak with you, and uh, who you, to the people of America. But, uh, come, monsieur, there is no need for formalities. My interview on Elba taught me, if nothing else, the value of relaxation. Uh, sit down, please. Thank you, sire. I have made a decision, a very difficult decision, but one which I know your people will understand. I'm going ahead. I'm going to La Prépare. You're going to attack? No, I shall not attack. I shall take my troops part of the way up to the pass. Then I shall stop there. I shall dismount. I shall walk up ahead to the breastworks. I shall greet my soldiers and I shall say to them, Soldier, if there is one among you who would kill his emperor, let him do it. Here I am. That is what I shall do. And what do you expect will happen, sire? Eh bien, that is a good question. What do I expect will happen, I will tell you. My men, my comrades, my soldiers, will go over the barricade. They will embrace me. They will shout, Vive l'Empereur! They will cry, I will cry, we shall all shed happy tears. And then, together, we will march to Paris. That is what will happen. But, sire, how can you be sure this will happen? The soldiers at left repass have sworn allegiance to Louis XVIII. They are commanded by Bourbon officers who hate you. Do you expect the men to disobey their officers? I do not expect the men to disobey their emperor. Who are these men at left repass? I know them. They are a battalion of the Pitre regiment. Men who fought with me at Australia, Vienna, Moscow, all across Europe and back again. They are my children. And once the soldiers of the Pitre rally to my side... 
All the other regiments in France will follow. That may be true, sire, but surely you must realize that if one soldier presses the trigger, you may be killed. Not I may be killed, monsieur. I will be killed. I train my soldiers to be good marksmen. I, uh, I put on some weight, as you can see. If anything, I am a better target today than I was uh, prior to my late vacation. But I assure you, not one soldier will fire, not one trigger will be pressed. But what about the Bourbon officers, sir? Oh, first, they will not have the courage to shoot me themselves. Second, they will be much too busy saving their own necks to take time off for even one wild shot. A little cop. But why are you taking this risk, Your Majesty? Why not heed the suggestion of your staff officers and retire to Gap where you can arm the citizenry? Yes, that would be a way. But that would mean civil war. And that I will not have. If I am to take my place again on the throne of France, I must be placed there as I was once before. By the three, the unanimous choice of the French people and the French army. If blood must be shed, the blood must be mine and mine alone. I hope the people of America will uh, understand this. I know they will. Thank you, sire. Napoleon has risen and is once again talking to Marshal Bertrand. Now the two men are walking, the other staff officers following them to the door. The sentries have thrown it open. Napoleon has gone out onto the porch. We're following him and the little Corsican has been greeted by his soldiers and by the people gathered here in the village square. Napoleon has raised his hat. He is smiling at the warmth of their welcome. The people are shouting, Vive l'Empereur. And now a little girl has run out from the crowd. She has a bouquet of flowers in her hand and she offers them to Napoleon. The little Corsican reaches down, has taken the flowers, Gives them to Marshal Betra, and now he lifts the little girl up in his arms and is kissing her on both cheeks. The child is laughing happily. The crowd is relishing this little scene, and even the soldiers in the ranks are smiling. Napoleon has set the little girl down now. He turns to the mayor of Lamur, who is on the porch with him. The former French emperor is thanking the mayor of this small village for his hospitality. The mayor bows and beams. This certainly is a day he won't forget. One of the Napoleon's aides has brought up a white charger, and now the little Corsican swings into the saddle. He spurs the horse gently, and now he moves out toward the head of the line. Marshal Deckman, also mounted, rides a few paces behind, and after them, the other staff officers. Napoleon as halted his horse, he wheels around, raises his hat once again to the cheering people. Bertrand has raised his arm and motions the loop forward. The military band has struck up a march, and the villagers are swinging in behind the troops. Evidently, they all intend to follow along up the mountain road. The advance has begun. Napoleon, at the head of his troops, is marching on last repair. Thanks to these troops alone and unarmed. 
As far as I know, he's issued no new orders. Is that correct, Captain Rondo? Of course. Why should I issue new orders? My old orders are good enough. And what are they, Mon Capitaine? To stop General Bonaparte. But isn't it true, sir, that you expect an attack in force? I have had no particular expectations in this situation. If, if one man comes, if 600 come, I will do my duty. I will stop one man. I will stop 600. I, I will stop 6,000. Well, will you order your men to fire on General Bonaparte, sir, or will you attempt to take him alive? I will order them to fire. And you expect them to obey? <laughs> what a question. Soldiers always obey. That, that is why they are soldiers. Captain Rondo, General Bonaparte said a few moments ago that your men will not fire and that the officers of this battalion will not have the courage to fire. What about that? Look, 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 my friend. Here is my pistol. It is primed and cocked. My finger is on the trigger. Let him come. Let him come and find out for himself. But, Captain Rondo, these men of the fifth fought with General Bonaparte at his side. How can you be so confident that they will obey your command to shoot him down in cold blood? You do not believe they will, monsieur. Uh, dear, here is one of my men. Ask him for yourself. Go on. Go on, ask him. Captain Rondo has pointed out one of the soldiers standing against the breastwork. Dites moi un soldat. Est-ce que vous pensez dire et attirer sur le général Bonaparte quand on vous ordonnera de le faire? Alors, vous allez tirer, oui ou non? I just asked the soldier in French if he will obey the order to shoot General Bonaparte, and he answered, in exact words were, I will obey orders. Alors, soldat, vous n'êtes pas très l'homme qui vous peut nous dire la victoire en votre ancien empereur? J'obéirai mes ordres. Vous ne vous rallierez pas au General Bonaparte? J'obéirai mes ordres. To every question, the soldier has a single answer. I will obey orders. Merci, soldat. You see, monsieur? My men are good soldiers. They will obey orders. And also, they are, they are good Frenchmen. They have had their fill of this, this, this Corsican brigand. They have seen their brothers die. Slaughtered in the battle. Victims of General Bonaparte's insane thirst for power and glory. France has had enough of this butcher. Enough. I thank God that I shall be the man privileged to order his death. Thank you, Captain Rondo. Down here below us on the road that winds up from La Mure, General Bonaparte's troops and the people following them have passed behind a ridge. For the moment, they're hidden from sight. But we know they're coming, and as soon as they come within range, we'll return you to John Daly. Now, we take you across the waters of the Mediterranean to the island of Elba. Ken Roberts reporting. Here on the island of Elba, in a sitting room of the tiny palace at Porto Parejo, Napoleon's home and headquarters during his year of exile, is Napoleon's mother. Madame Bonaparte confesses to her 65th year, but she has the spirit and the energy of a person half that age. Certainly, Madame Bonaparte is one of the most extraordinary women in history. She has seen three of her sons become kings and one of her daughters a queen. She has seen the rise and the fall of the house of Bonaparte, and all who know her agree that she has taken the good and the evil with unmatched dignity and honest humility. Now, with her son marching toward his most fateful hour, she is still the same proud head of the house of Bonaparte. Madame Bonaparte, your son is taking a terrible risk. Why is he doing it? Why is he so sure that the soldiers of the fifth will not fire upon him? My son... Napoleone? No, no. You will not be harmed by the soldiers of France. They love Napoleone. They have called him to come back. They need him. Like, they cannot do without him. Why do you say the soldiers have called him back, Madame Bonaparte? Did your son ever receive any official invitation from the French army to return to France? Official? Oh, is there anything more official than the voice of France crying out in agony? Official. Everyone who came here to see Napoleone, they told him of the suffering of the people. So much toxic. The king takes away their land 
and gives it to the aristocrat. The secret police to make everybody afraid. Napoleone, he looked across the water to France and he cried. Well, I have never known my son to cry before. Official invitation. Napoleone had to go back. France needed him back. Your son's enemies have declared that if he should succeed in regaining the throne of France, he'll throw all Europe into war in his attempt to reestablish his empire. No, no. That's not true. Napoleone has had enough of the glory of empire, enough of war. Now he wants only peace. He'll stay in France and uh, he will govern wisely under a new constitution. He has told me the people will be free. You shall see. France shall have peace and freedom. Thank you, Madame Bonaparte. But John Daly at Laffrey Pass reports that Napoleon is well on his way to the summit. As soon as he arrives, we'll interrupt our broadcast. Now we take you to Vienna and Don Hollenbeck. Here at the Palace of Schönbrunn, news headquarters for the Congress of Vienna, the representatives of the great powers that defeated Napoleon and sent him to Elba are remaking the map of Europe. Prince de Talleyrand is with us. Prince de Talleyrand, the former Minister of State for General Bonaparte, at present Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Bourbon King Louis XVIII, and the representative of France at this Congress. Monsieur de Talleyrand, you've known General Bonaparte a long time. You were one of his closest advisors. Why do you think he's risking everything on what you might call a single throw of the dice? Oh, it is obvious, my good friend. Consider the Corsican as it truly is. An egomaniac. Then it all becomes as clear as the crystal in this glass. Denied the death of a hero on the battlefield, he now seeks the martyrdom of a hero in a setting he thinks most proper for his dramatic action. You believe, Monsieur de Talleyrand, that General Bonaparte's return from exile is merely a prelude to suicide? But of course, certainly. And you also think the soldiers will fire on him? Oh, I'm indifferent to what the soldiers do. It does not matter. If they fire, well and good, exit General Bonaparte. If they do not, then it is possibly may go to Paris. He may even seat himself on the throne. <laughs> For a brief moment. But then what? Surely he has not lost his uh, exquisite sense of judgment so far that he does not understand that sooner or later all Europe will rise up against him and break him with the ease with which I break this glass. Yes, monsieur. This is suicide. Suicide at La Frépasse or somewhere else later on. But suicide on a Napoleonic scale. This is John Daly at Laffrey Pass. We've interrupted the broadcast from Vienna as Napoleon's troops stop a few hundred yards from the breastworks manned by the troops of the Royalist 5th Regiment. Napoleon has dismounted. He's talking now with Marshal Betvire and the other staff officers. Apparently, they're still pleading with him to change his mind... Only time will tell us whether or not they are successful with their pleas. We came on ahead of the troops, have taken up a position between the pass and the place where Napoleon halted his men. We're behind some very welcome boulders, safe enough, we hope, if and when the firing begins. The people who came up with Napoleon have scattered onto the sides of the road, Behind the troops have taken shelter, as it were, on the sides of the mountain and will probably stay there until some decision has been taken by Napoleon and his staff still busily talking. No, Napoleon is walking up the road now. He's left his officers and is striding slowly up the rock-strewn path that cuts through the mountain up to Laffrey Pass. A frozen silence has come to this brutally bare chasm high in the French... Alps and all eyes are on that lone figure. It's an incredible moment. A moment charged with drama and tension. The former French emperor alone, unarmed, walking squarely into the guns of the men who once fought under his eagle. Napoleon risking his life, risking everything on his belief in the loyalty, the love of these men 
who are his old soldiers who have fought with him for many years across the face of Europe. He is now in range of their guns, but but a shot has rung out. Ned, Ned Kelmer up with the Royalist troops. Is Captain Rondon giving the order to fire? No, John, not yet. Not yet. The soldiers are leaning against the breastworks. Every musket aimed at Napoleon. Captain Rondon is watching the little figure of Napoleon as he comes closer and closer. He must be waiting for a point blank range. Napoleon is now within 100 yards of the breastworks, perhaps less, and he himself has told us that these old troops of his are good shots. He still strides slowly on, his long gray coat sweeping the road, his right hand in that characteristic gesture tucked inside his coat across his chest. Napoleon is still going on. He doesn't stop. He's going on ahead, closer, ever closer to those muskets, pressing on as if he were determined to walk right through the pass itself, over the breastworks, and right into Paris. But now he has stopped. Napoleon has Hold stopped on, speaking to his troops. Soldiers of the 5th, soldiers of the 5th, do you recognize me? If there is one among you, he says, who wishes to kill his emperor, he is free to do so. Here I am. Napoleon opened his coat, and as he spoke those words, he flung out his arm in a gesture of invitation to the soldiers, but not a shot has been fired. It's amazing, unbelievable. The muzzles of a thousand muskets are pointed at his heart, and no one, no one pulls the trigger. Rondon has given the order to fire, but not a gun has replied, and again Rondon has cried, fire. A soldier cries out, long live the emperor. Now another, long live Napoleon. Rondon still is yelling his orders to fire, but the troops refuse to fire. They're taking up the cry of long live the emperor, long live Napoleon. They're casting their muskets over the breastworks. And the soldier is just hurtled over the breastworks, running towards Napoleon. Others follow him. It's like a flood now pouring over the breastworks. All of the troops, all of them are rushing to Napoleon's side. Napoleon's guards are rushing up now too. And the troops to the fifth embrace their emperor, shouting and cheering, weeping, weeping for joy, just as Napoleon said they would. And the band, listen to the band, they struck up their last ears. The soldiers have begun to sing it, standing in the road. And now the people, the people of Namur, are pouring down from the mountainside, joining them in a frenzy of celebration. Just listen to this, just listen. Thank you. 